the healthcare industry just in the last 10 years has made some real significant strides in how they, the diseases that they treat and how they treat them. And I still think it's, it's just in its infancy, if you will, that people can, uh, young people can get into it. They're smart, they can contribute, they can help uh, conquer a lot of these diseases that are out there and are prevalent. From one university studio at the University of North Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth, welcome to Innovate Fort Worth, the podcast where we highlight local innovation and the people bringing those innovations to market. I'm Cameron Cushman, and on today's episode, we'll meet the entrepreneur who brought a widely used cold remedy to market and then sold it for $2.3 billion. My guest today is John Adams, the founder of Mucinex, who built not just one, but four successful startups using the same active ingredient. In his career, John has created over 5,500 jobs and has mentored and trained the next generation of biotech leaders in North Texas. John has also gone on to invest in several biotech and life sciences startups and has been an active philanthropist. John, welcome to Innovate Fort Worth. Thank you. So John, you've had a really remarkable career and I'm so glad that you were able to join us on the show today. But tell us how you got your start. Um, by the skin of my teeth, <laughs> really Cameron. We were originally in Salina, Kansas and I knew I had to get out of Kansas. There weren't enough people there to do much. And um, as we develop the story, you'll uh, understand why we ended up down in this area. But um, it was uh, really from scratch and uh, had a family and three children. So uh, it wasn't easy financially, but as it turns out, we all know now it worked out well. That's great. Originally born and raised in Ohio, correct? That's correct. And what got you to Salina, Kansas? When I graduated from college in Ohio in 58, um, there was a pretty severe recession in Ohio. And I looked around for a job, couldn't find any. My uncle invited me to come to Kansas City uh, with him, which wasn't quite as bad in the recession as Ohio was. So I did, and I interviewed in um, landed a job as a pharmaceutical rep, uh, which moved me to Salina, Kansas. So what brought you to North Texas? And, and I've, this is a really fascinating story. So tell me why you decided to get out of Salina and how you ended up in North Texas. Uh, there just wasn't enough population in Kansas to work with. Um, but I sent to four or five different chamber of commerces a letter just asking for some specific information increase in hospital beds, you know, that kind of thing that pertain to pharmaceutical industry. It was St. Louis, Kansas City, Wichita, Dallas, and Phoenix, those five cities. And uh, St. Louis responded and told me exactly um, how many gas meters they installed last year. Um, I didn't hear from any of the other cities except Dallas. And Dallas sent me um, huge stack of information on uh, the Dallas area and um, uh, two plane tickets for my wow. wife and I to come down to Dallas. Wow. So that's that's the way I ended up here. If Phoenix or one of the other cities might have uh, responded a little differently, I might have been there, but I'm, I'm so pleased that it's North Texas. So they bought you two plane tickets yes. and you and your wife come down here to right. visit and you end up moving here and end up having an amazing career in biotech. Is this the best ever investment that a Chamber of Commerce has ever made as far as economic development goes? Oh, I think so. It, yes. So for, for yeah. a few hundred dollars, they ended up creating uh, 5,500 jobs right. and, and four uh, pharma companies. That's pretty incredible. And it was really interesting because I was moving down to this area and it just so happened I've there was a guy moving from uh, Hearst to Salina, Kansas. So we just traded houses. No way. Yeah, and that's the way I ended up 
in really in Tarrant County. That is incredible. <laughs> well, somebody needs to call our Chamber of Commerce and see if we're sending out any more plane tickets for people to come and right. visit. Right. <laughs> That's great. So it's not an exaggeration to say that you built an entire career out of a single active ingredient for treating respiratory illnesses. The ingredient's called guaiafenicin, and I hope I said it right. Yep, uh, you did. How was guaiafenicin discovered, and how did you stumble upon it? Well, it um, it's an old, old uh, chemical in the pharmaceutical world. Uh, it's the active ingredient in Robitussin, which people know. And through the regulatory process, um, the FDA eliminated everything else in the category of expectorants except guaifenesin. And why did they eliminate those in the category? Uh, different reasons. Um, ineffective, too many side effects, the normal um, way they evaluate products like that. And this was in the world where the FDA was still a relatively new regulatory body, correct? Yes, but still had a lot of influence. Still had a lot of influence and power, <laughs> yes. okay. Yes. So they eliminated everything in the category of guaifenesin except for guaifenesin. So you decided to pick it up and See if you could run with it? Yes, and the the big thing was when first got started, um, when I was still a rep, uh, a doctor challenged me on one of my products that had uh, an antihistamine and glyphenicin in it. Said it was an irrational product. And if I could prove to him that any ref, any medical reference that said it was indicated in bronchitis, he would use it exclusively. So I spent the weekend at the library <laughs> trying to find that reference and it didn't exist. So the very first product I developed was one that had guaifenesin and a decongestant, but no antihistamine. So you eliminate the side effect of drowsiness uh, and it eventually became I think the 76th most frequently prescribed drug in the country. Wow. That was, uh, it went generic, of course, and all that. And what was the name of that drug? Intex. Intex, okay. So that was your first experiment with guaifenesin. Yes. Which was really removing something, which was removing the antihistamine right. to make it novel and unique. Right. And at this point, is, uh, is guaifenesin actually approved by the FDA? Oh, yes, yes. It okay. still is the only approved expectorant. Okay. As far as I know, by the FDA. But you're just working around the formula to try to make it unique enough to where you can get it on patent or, or sell it in a different way? The FDA came out um, when they were doing this review on it. At that time, the dosage on guaifenesin for an adult was 800 milligrams a day. 200 milligrams four times a day. They came out and said that they were going to increase the effective dose to 2,400 milligrams a day, uh, which is a lot. Wow. And guaifenesin is, it's not totally inert, but it's it doesn't have many effects. But if you take that much of it at once, you kind of get a quasi feeling, kind of like you do if you're getting a little seasick on a boat or something. But okay. you never, it doesn't cause nausea. So we developed a long acting form of it to be able to get to 2,400 milligrams, but spread it out over eight to 12 hours. And we got around that side effect that way. Got it. And then you went, you proceeded to build two more companies based on guaifenesin. Tell me about those. Yes, well, the, the long acting, um, the first long acting uh, guaifenesin, trade named Humabid, um, that uh, eventually we sold to uh, Mediva. Okay. Out of the UK. Um, and I went on their board and uh, we expanded our presence here in the US quite a bit through Mediva's influx of capital. And then did you go straight into Mucinex after that or was there another one in between? No, there, well, after I sold the first company, there was a non compete clause and uh, sold it to Morton Norwich. And we happened to be in a conference at Morton Norwich and they were talking about the veterinary business. And come to find out through this conference that the veterinary dermatology business was small, but it was growing extremely rapidly. So uh, because I had a non-compete, I couldn't get back into the respiratory business on humans. Um, we, myself and 
another guy decided to start a veterinary dermatology company, which we did. And uh, we ended up selling that five years later to um, Bierbach out of France, which is the largest vet company in the world. So you're focused on humans, you're focused on respiratory well, it's kind of ailments, and then you go into veterinarian. Yeah, small animals uh, exhibit respiratory problems through their skin. They don't get asthma, they don't get bronchitis. They exhibit any kind of a respiratory malfunction through their skin. So it creates that dermatitis. So we were very familiar with uh, the process of how animals react. That's fascinating. And was guaifenesin in that product as well? No, no. Okay, it so that was, that was a different product. Yeah. So the Mucinex story uh, was a little bit controversial when it, uh, when it came out, but I want to start with you running clinical trials on a product, guaifenesin, that was already pretty widely used in the marketplace already. Why did you do that, and what was your strategy to, to run clinical trials and then take that to market? Guaifenesin was one of those products in the, with the FDA that had never been approved by the FDA. Okay. Um, except uh, short-acting liquids. So we, um, we messed around with some long-acting forms and uh, took it to the FDA. They turned it down that it didn't fit their parameters of the C-min, the C-max, et cetera. And they were comparing it to a liquid. So they turned it down, but we still felt like there was a market there. And uh, fortunately, I had a guy in product development working with me, Bob Davis, that uh, uh, walked into my office and say, I can solve that problem for you. Um, he said, I can put a tablet on a tablet make the first part of it come out quick to achieve that C-max like a liquid does. He said, and I can put another tablet on there that is long acting that will achieve the long acting effect and come out with a C-min, uh, which he did. And eventually that was Mucinex, but it was because of the FDA didn't accept the first one that we submitted that uh, we went back to them drawing board, if you will, and Bob came up with the formula that, um, along with a lot of other people. So we basically just put the short acting and the long acting together in the right. same treatment, on, in the same pill, and that was different enough to go back to the FDA for regula regulatory approval that had not been granted previously. Correct. Um, we hit all the parameters the FDA had set out that we had to hit. So you were betting that the FDA would interpret their rules a particular way, particularly regarding a, a drug and a treatment that had never uh, been approved before by the FDA. And the hope was that that would force your competitors off the market. How'd you arrive at that strategy and how did you convince the FDA that you were right? Well, it was almost by accident. We submitted the uh, new drug application from Mucinex to the FDA and we submitted it as a prescription product. We, when the FDA approved it, they approved it as an over-the-counter product. None of us had any experience in over-the-counter market. We were just totally in the prescription market. Um, and one of the people that is very prevalent here in uh, Fort Worth now, Jeff Keiser was my um, regulatory person and um, the FDA law says that you cannot have a prescription product identical to an over-the-counter product. So we just took the FDA, their own rules, and said, we've got approval on the OTC. You cannot have a prescription now of the same kind, so therefore you gotta take them all off the market. And they agreed to do that. So I bet that angered some of your competitors. It did. Uh, there were some of them I didn't get Christmas cards from after that. <laughs> oh, bet not. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So that was a pretty big gamble. Yeah, it was, but it, um, thank, and that's why you hire really good people when you have a startup company that um, really know what they're doing. And in this case, it, Jeff in the regulatory arena was really good. So what year was this when you got the, the approval and, and all the competitors had to be pulled off the market? I believe 04. Okay. So you're off to the races with Mucinex, essentially in the form that we know it today, and you have no competition. Did you have patent protection, or how long did oh, that yeah, last? Oh, yeah, it was patented. Um, 
which the patent just ran out in October of, um, I believe it was October of this year, 19. Wow. Um, and it was interesting, again, they did the, the bio studies and they established 20% plus or minus of the curve and that's what we patented. To be a generic, you only have to do 10%. So we had protected all the way up to 20% uh, in the release uh, profile. And that, that eliminated uh, generics. And did you do that just to be safe or because that was actually part of the strategy? That was part of the strategy. Part of the strategy. Yeah, just keep the product exclusive to us. So John, when I think of Mucinex, I think of the ads that featured Mr. Mucus, the slimy, disgusting character meant to represent a head cold. How did Mr. Mucus come to be? It came through an advertising agency in New York City. Um, we were at a board meeting. Uh, we had the company here in, um, actually in Fort Worth, it was out at uh, Center. And uh, they mo moved it to um, New Jersey. And we were in a board meeting and we had said it was going to take about 65 million in an advertising budget for Mucinex to get it established. And this was one of the presentations that was made to the board about how to advertise it, along with a couple others. And this was the one we chose uh, to go with. And it, it's unbelievable the recognition that it has uh, in the marketplace right now, still today and they're still using it to some extent. Yeah, it's got to be the most recognizable drug character probably ever created. Um, you know, those, those commercials are always kind of awkward because they got to read all the FDA things, you know, all the, all the FDA warnings, but Mr. Mucus really stands out as something that has stood the test of time. I guess everybody gets mucus, huh? Yeah, you do if you have any malfunctions of the respiratory tract. That's exactly right. So as Mucinex grew and became approved for over-the-counter distribution, you actually stepped down as CEO. Uh, why did you do that, and do you think it was the right decision? Well, oh, there's no question it was the right decision. Uh, as I said earlier, myself nor anybody that I had in management in my organization had any over-the-counter experience at all. And uh, so in the interest of our shareholders, it behooved me to step down as CEO and go find somebody, for the board to go find somebody that had the experience in over-the-counter products that could take Mucinex and run with it. So I, I relinquished my position as CEO. I kept the position as chairman and uh, we hired um, a guy from Novartis that had a lot of over-the-counter experience. Was that hard to kind of step back and, and give your baby over to someone else? Not really, because um, the shareholders were the people that put up the money for us to get where we were. And to, I just don't believe you turn your back on them by saying, my ego's getting in the way, so I don't know how to run this, but I'm going to do it anyhow and botch it up. Uh, so I, did, I, was, I was pleased that um, we found somebody that knew how to market it and uh, take it to the place it is today. So in 2004, you get your competitors essentially removed from the market. You've got uh, lots of runway, uh, but then in 2005, you actually take Mucinex public. What was that like for you to, to take a company public and did you get to ring the bell at the New York Stock Exchange? Um, the answer to your, about the stock exchange is no. I, I was invited there, but something came up and I, I didn't go. It was exciting, there's no doubt about that, uh, about just the reputation that Mucinex was getting in the marketplace. And we had also, in the meantime, developed uh, a Mucinex with a decongestant, a Mucinex with a cough suppressant, and all those were submitted to the FDA under that same NDA and approved uh, as a product line extension. So uh, having grown up in small companies, the bureaucracy and all that of a large company just did not appeal to me at all. Um, and when they decided to do an IPO and I, was there to witness everything that had to be accomplished. Um, it just, it didn't interest me. And uh, as a result, I think it was in, um, 
08, I resigned then as chairman. So, John, I know that one of the things that you were very passionate about in your companies was protecting shareholder value. You've already mentioned the shareholders a couple of times here. What did that mean for you, and what advice would you have for people currently company, uh, running companies as the best way to do that? Well, I, I think if you're running a company and somebody gives you X amount of dollars, I don't care if it's a little amount or a large amount, at that point in time, I think you're obligated to do whatever you can to increase that value that shareholders would receive from your, from your company. One of the lessons that I was taught very early on was treat that stock of a small company like gold. Uh, just don't give it away uh, with no reason or no cause. The second thing I was taught was if you are giving your employees yearly raises, like everybody does, why don't you give the shareholders a raise in the form of a dividend? It made a lot of sense to me. And so we did pay a dividend um, in the, the, third Adam, the third Adams we had, the one that uh, before the Mucinex development. Because the, the parent company was called Adams Laboratories, but Mucinex was the product. That's right, yes. Very good. So you're still very active as an investor, advisor, and a board member in several different companies in the healthcare industry. Where do you see healthcare headed in the, in the near future? If I had uh, a child today that I was going to advise to whatever they wanted to do, I would definitely steer them in the healthcare field, uh, as opposed to maybe an attorney or an accountant or something like that. Uh, the healthcare industry, just in the last 10 years, has made some real significant strides in how they, the diseases that they treat and how they treat them. And I still think it's, it's just in its infancy, if you will, that people can, uh, young people can get into it. They're smart, they can contribute, they can help uh, conquer a lot of these diseases that are out there and are prevalent. Yeah, there's definitely that double bottom line, if you will, in healthcare of you can make a lot of money, you can build a very successful company, but you can also cure a disease or, or help alleviate symptoms or really help people feel better. Yes, uh, everybody likes to get a return on their investment and all that, but basically, if you're in a healthcare field, you're there to help somebody that has a particular disease or uh, something like that that you can help them feel better, extend their lifespan, or whatever the case might be. So I know that several of your former colleagues at Adams Laboratories have gone on to have very successful careers, and they've even built a few startup companies of their own, including Al Guillaume and Jeff Kieser, who developed and sold ZS Pharma for $2.7 billion in 2017. Did you know early on that they were gonna be so successful? Uh, no, I didn't. If I'd have known they were going to be that successful, I would have invested more money with them. <laughs> Very good. So they hit you up early on on those oh, yes. deals. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I have the utmost respect in the world for um, both Al and Jeff. Um, the, the function they performed in Mucinex and in Adams, period, was just unbelievable. They're really, really sharp people. Uh, and uh, I really enjoy being around them, and I still enjoy being around them, uh, investing in what the companies that they're starting now. And you must have trained them well, huh? <laughs> well, they're doing well. And they're on to their next startup, right? Yes, they are. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's going to be a fascinating story to watch. They would be good guys to bet on uh, if I had some money to invest. So, John, last question for you. Who is your favorite innovator in Fort Worth? If I was... Looking back early on in my career, uh, I would say it was Ed Schulemeyer. Okay. Uh, that Ed did, of Alcon fame, yes, right? Yes. That did uh, so much to continue what uh, Mr. O'Connor and uh, they had started. He was really, to me, very influential in, in doing that. But currently, the two people I know best are Al Gilliam and Jeff Geezer. Uh, these guys are really, really sharp. Uh, they have some, they've been great at networking. They've identified opportunities out of medical schools and that kind of thing. But I think currently they are two, and I, 
there's probably other people out there that are as good as Alan Jeff. I just don't personally know them. I know Alan Jeff very well, and so that would be my response. That's great. Well, they, Alan Jeff certainly have the uh, the chops to say that and to be on that list, no doubt about it. So, well, John, thank you so much for joining me on Innovate Fort Worth. It's been a fascinating conversation, and uh, thanks for sharing your story with us. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, Cameron. Are you an entrepreneur or business owner looking to take your company to the next level? Are you a wantrepreneur with an idea that's bursting inside of you but don't know how to take the first step? Or are you just looking to see all the cool entrepreneurial events happening in Fort Worth and beyond? Then come check out Sparkyard, the totally free, totally awesome website that will get you plugged into the Fort Worth entrepreneurial ecosystem. Visit us at sparkyard.co. That's sparkyard.co. Sparkyard, the right resource at the right time. Innovate Fort Worth is brought to you by UNT Health Science Center, where we are driven to improve the human condition through a passion for innovation and teamwork.